All right, here we go. Population ecology. Let's get into it. The major things that, to go over today uh, in terms of learning objectives that are associated with this lecture is uh, I really want to spend the, the most time thinking about describing the factors of population ecology and resource availability. This fits into our narrative so nicely about the interconnected systems that vary across space and time and that re energy and, and resources are the main thing that drive all ecological, it's the underpinning for all ecological dynamics, uh, which is the second sentence of our narrative. That's the story that we're telling, uh, but there's a lot of key stuff that we have embedded inside of this, which is uh, these key definitions about niche, population growth patterns, carrying capacity, R and K selected species, generalists and specialists, and survivorship curves. It's a lot of different stuff, uh, but all of those really roll up pretty nice and discreetly underneath the very first learning objective. Uh, so I wanted to uh, make sure that I mentioned that. We've seen this sort of organization several times in this class. We saw it with watershed, we saw it with uh, diversity of species, we have genetic diversity that is inside of uh, population diversity, which inside of ecosystem diversity, and, and so on and so forth. Different layers of granularity. So when we look at nature and we're talking about the complexity of, of organisms inside of an, e an ecosystem, these are all the different layers that, that we have uh, to discuss. What is driving the dynamics that help us define and understand all of that is availability of resources how the abiotic and biotic realms both interact with one another. So that's things like availability of solar insulation, the amount of precipitation, the health and fertility of the soil, etc. So at the very base level, we have an individual. Any single individual of a species. That is the, 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 the very basis of this. And individuals, they have one, uh, one goal in life. They want to survive for as long as they can survive. They want to reproduce and pass their genes on to one another. And that's it. It's very small. Their ability to do that and their success rate is largely driven by the first principle, the abiotic and biotic realms, how they interact within the ecosystem, but also their availability of resources. If we take a bunch of individuals together, we call that a population of a single species. So whenever you hear this word population, always think single species. So this is a herd of elk. An individual is a single elk. Next is a community. And so once we get into a community, we see the complexity of organisms interacting with one another. And there are many complex ways that organisms interact. They do fall into certain categories and certain relationships, uh, but a community is many different species with inside of the same ecosystem. And we have diversity within an ecosystem, but the key thing being the energy and matter flows up and down from individuals with inside of a population and back and forth between organisms inside of a community. So the result of species interaction and physical processes on Earth is due to the complexity and interaction of individual populations uh, with inside of a community that is inside of an ecosystem which fits into a biome, which fits into this larger thing we call the biosphere, which is all living things. Feel good? Me too. So population ecology, in the upper left hand tile there, there's a little uh, three, uh, a little dial that shows uh, what that or organism complexity is. But I also put this example on here uh, because this is wolf and moose and population. So here are some years, here are wolves on the blue line, on the secondary axis here are wolves on the purple line. And you can see that the number of organisms isn't driven just by the resources, it's also driven by the interaction between populations within a community. And so we want to make sure that we respect both of those driving principles. So natural communities are made of many different species of populations that are living together, but the resources are highly limited. 
this is a big idea. I'm going to define density and, and dependent and density independent in a second, but let's focus here on, on this first thing. There are limiting factors inside of every single biome. So if I want to understand how many population of an organism I can have and how do they interact within a community, the first thing I need to know is, well, what is the thing that's limiting uh, the resources available for populations to increase uh, or to survive generally? And so what would be a, a nice quick list of resources that might be limited that might impact terrestrial ecosystems? Give me a, give me a couple. Precipitation, beautiful. Temperature. Temperature. What else? Uh, primary producers, but that's mostly driven by these things that you've already said. What else? Solar insulation. Solar insulation, amount of solar energy, absolutely. What else? Soil the soil, fa fabulous. Soil formation, really good. What about in, in uh, marine ecosystems or aquatic ecosystems? Salinity. Oh, we've got salinity, yeah. Oh, we need oxygen for sure. Uh, oh, death. We have depth and stability, the movement of water, for sure. What else? We don't care as much about precipitation because we're already in water, but what do we care about? Access to sunlight. Access to sunlight still matters, and there's another thing that usually goes with soil formation, but what does it look like in the water? Just nutrient availability, right? Uh, so there's a lot more exchange. So because resources are limited, there's eventually going to be a maximum size of any population that an ecosystem can maintain. And it's driven by these factors, which I'll, we'll explore more in a second. Uh, so I want to look at this next thing here. Uh, the species resource requirements are different based on the most basic thing that we've already discussed, where they're at on the trophic level. How big are they? How fast is their metabolic rate? So are they uh, an organism that needs heat to survive, like the beluga whale? Or are they a cold-blooded animal, like a snake or an insect? That, or are they a tree? Um, their metabolic rate is fairly consistent. How long are they going to be alive? And what is their strategy for reproduction? So in the previous slide, the big acknowledgement was, my goal, or any individual's goal, is to survive and thrive and flourish and live a healthy and productive life for as long as I can and have offspring. And so all of those things that go into survive, thrive, flourish, and have a high quality of life and have offspring are dependent on the resources that are available. Make sense? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Competition for resources is very fierce. Because resources, every ecosystem is limited by something, there is always going to be competition for the resources that are available. When resources are more limited, competition tends to be very fierce. So we want to explore competition in kind of two different ways. The first way is I want to look at competition between species. Let's look at this graph on the right-hand side. This graph is a storyboard. Uh, the number of individuals is on the y-axis, and the size of seeds, this is an example, is on the x-axis. So we have large seeds on the right side, small seeds on this side, and uh, we have the availability of resources uh, controlling the two populations, so the number of individuals here. Because resources are limited, there are not, and this is one of those like finite for sure, we can actually use uh, uh, finite phrases here, there are not enough resources for two species to coexist in the same spot within the ecosystem. We call that the competitive exclusion principle. And it states that there are not enough resources. So what happens is, in this space where competition is occurring, there's not enough resources, so we end up having some individuals over here within the population and some individuals in here in the population. This is driving, and we'll explore this in a lot more detail later, so this won't be the first time you hear it, uh, but that results in evolution. And so blue 
normal distribution hump and yellow normal distribution hump end up being two species in the future. And they're, they're separated over time. So when the species evolve, they fill different spaces and they occupy different roles within the ecosystem. And therefore, the available resources are spread out to help reduce competition between species. This is all between species competition we're talking about. And that is known as resource partitioning. So the resources are partitioned into different spaces within the ecosystem. Everybody good on text? I'm going to show an example here on the next slide. Sorry, that was good or no? Got it? Um, I'll leave it for a second. Okay. Let me come back to that next thing after I do the exam. Here. Birds are... Uh, birds highlight this phenomenon beautifully. So here are some species of warblers that would be found in a temperate forest biome. And what this is showing us is evolution has occurred over time. So these birds genetically are very similar to one another. Uh, they even look very similar. Their phenotypes are, are similar. But you would find all of these five species of birds within the same ecosystem. So let's look at just the ecosystem. Here is a nice depiction of a temperate forest ecosystem. We have deciduous trees. We, have, we know how much energy and precipitation we would probably get because of those observations. But what you find is, let's take food as an example. So they're gonna eat small berries and small nuts that come from the trees. The Cape May warbler would only be found in this part of the canopy of the trees. And they would only reproduce, and they would only eat in that area, and they would only survive in that area. Uh, and, and then we would have something like the yellow rump war warbler that would eat the seeds that fall on the ground, and they would only be found in this space. So because the resources are limited in the forest, different bird species file into different niches within that ecosystem. We call that resource partitioning. Let me go back a slide uh, because I want to think about uh, one key thing here before we proceed. At the very bottom here is kind of a big key. The more resources that are there, the more niches that you could have, the more species would be present. This is a huge idea. It's not going to be like a show me which way this goes, this, that on a test. But this helps us really understand a lot of things uh, about how organisms exist on our planet. So more resources equals more niches equals more species. So what kinds of biomes would we expect to have the most resources? Give me some examples. Yeah. Rainforest. Tropical rainforest. Great. Give me another example. Um, we temperate forests have quite a bit, but not as much as the... Quite a bit, but not quite as much. Yeah. Coral reef, a beautiful uh, aquatic example. So those, or those ecosystems have more resources, but competition is equally fierce in the coral reef as it is in the desert. But because there are more resources, the resources get partitioned, and there are more niches. And the more niches you can have, the more species you can support. So why does the coral reef have so many different species? Because of the availability of resources and the number of niches. And because niches are being built over time, that's how evolution occurs. More evolution drives more species. Savvy? OK, good. All right, now I want to look at this, uh, this principle uh, related to niches around different types of species. The text is a little small. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean for it to be that small. We can plot every organism on planet Earth onto a continuum. We have two terms, two categories for referring to the poles of that continuum. 
the closer you are to one side, the closer you are to, to be characterized one way, and the closer to the other side, the other way. But there are organisms found all along in the middle. A generalist species is a species that can survive really well, even if the environmental conditions vary pretty widely. So what kinds of environments would have wide variations? What kinds of things would be driving wide variations in ecosystems? Where would we find those? Give me a couple examples. So we, what biomes would have really wide variations? Close to the equator. Mm, maybe not close to the equator. Something more. Within like this ecosystem, we take it, we look at it across time, it has really wide variations. Um, like something with a large seasonal variation. Seasonal variation would drive that, right? So maybe something like a boreal forest or a temperate forest has more seasonal variation than a tropical rainforest, right? So organisms that live in that environment, if you're a bear and you live in the boreal forest, you need to be able to survive if the weather is negative 20 degrees Celsius or if it's 30 degrees Celsius in the summer. That's a wide variation. So your life strategy and your ability to survive and your reproductive strategy and, and the way that you eat and survive is all driven by being able to survive and flourish within that environment, right? So the wider it is, the closer you are to the generalist side. They give an example of raccoons. Another example would be like the great horned owl. They're found almost everywhere in North America. They're found in Alaska. They're found in Guatemala. The raccoons can survive almost no matter what the environment is. They're considered a generalist. The opposite side is something, they give the panda bear example here uh, because they are so finicky, uh, but insects, cold-blooded organisms, all of those kinds of things, they would be found more on the specialist side. They can only survive in a niche that's very stable and doesn't have a lot of movement. So organisms, what would a biome uh, that looks really stable be? That would be somewhere close to the equator, not a lot of seasonal va variation. You put a thermometer in the coral reef, it's the same temperature in January, June, July, the same amount of solar insulation, the same amount of nutrient availability. That ecosystem looks fairly the same. So uh, we see these niche specialists being driven by ecosystem stability. So their life strategy, their ability to survive, flourish, and, and, and is all driven by the resource environment that they have to operate in. So generalists and specialists, uh, we know what the terms are, but the thing that's governing whether organisms tend to be one or the other isn't a conscious, conscious decision. It's what evolution has driven them to be because of resource availability. Make sense? Resources are key. Resources are key. <coughs> yeah, Josh. I was just wondering, where would humans fit? Humans would be generalists. Amazingly, because of our brain, Josh, humans are the most extreme version of generalists that exists on planet Earth. So humans can survive. You find human populations everywhere. And our ability to survive is not necessarily just because of our biology, but our thinking brain allows us to develop things like shelters and fire and clothing that allows us to survive when it's really cold. Uh, but it also allows us to develop things like fans and shade shelters that allow us to survive in desert communities or tropical rainforests. So humans are definitely as far to this extreme as you can possibly get. Bacteria, somewhere in the middle. Yeah, we did it, man. We did it. Uh, what's interesting is lots of things. Uh, let me not go down a rabbit hole here. Uh, <laughs> population dynamics. So now we're going to start, I just want to shift gears a little bit and, and think about, uh, so far we've been talking, uh, the whole thing is driven by resource availability. What we just finished talking about was, well, there's going to be competition between different species, but there's also competition within individuals inside of a population. So uh, within species, intraspecies competition. So let's look at this a little bit as well. So if I'm an individual and I exist inside of a population, my chief and exclusive goal on planet Earth is to survive, thrive, flourish, have a high quality of life and reproduce. <coughs> and so 
ability to do that is dependent on uh, other individuals with inside of my population, but it's still driven by the limiting factors. So now we have all kinds of uh, individuals. So you could take the warbler example. They're all surviving within the niche and population uh, dynamics are driven still by competition, but now in between species. So the competitive exclusion in principle only applies between species, but within a given niche, there's still competition for survival. And that makes perfect sense. And it's driven by abiotic and, and biotic factors. Changes in the environment causes all kinds of disruption to the way and the composition of populations. Lots of key terms there, uh, more on that uh, during our time on Thursday to help understand these. Uh, but what we see is the impacts of the trophic interactions and the availability of resources really drives how do you find organisms with inside their niche in the, in the ecosystem. So let's look at co a couple examples. Uniform makes perfect sense. This means uh, that the, the organisms, the individuals are spread out in a unified way, in a uniform way, and an uh, equal distance from one another. So that means with inside the ecosystem, there's a couple things driving this sort of thing. Sometimes it's like, well, there's abundant resources everywhere, uh, and so if I get too close over here, then I don't have enough resources, but if I'm over here, we're fine, and we all spread out an even and, and equal distance from one another. Uh, you see that a lot. The example here is penguins, and the reason why is because penguins set up a te territorial zone for mating, and they say, okay, this is my spot, and your spot is over there, and we're all gonna be in our own spot, right? Birds are highly territorial. Uh, so they work as a really great example. So when the resources are, are equally available across the ecosystem, everybody says, well, this is my spot, and you go over there. And so they're found in a uniform way. Random distribution looks like this. They're just totally however. And the example here is a really great one. And you see this a lot in the plant world. Uh, and it's driven by seed dispersal. So here, the example they're giving uh, is the dandelion. So a dandelion reproduces, creates seeds that are pollinated, which represent uh, new offspring, and uh, they're wind dispersed. So if the, the wind is most likely to carry most of the seeds just a little distance away from the parent. So you might see the most offspring right in this area. So they get, uh, they're here, but the wind will still carry them and they'll be in different places. And there's no predicting where the seed is gonna fall and land and, re and be successful. It's just dependent on whatever happens. So that ends up being kind of random. The last example is most closely associated with generalist species uh, being clumped together. There's something driving their ability to survive, thrive, and reproduce if they stay together. People are like this. The example they give here is elephants, which live in highly social communities. It's in an elephant's interest to not be out on its own, to be with the others in its group. And so you see them travel together and stick together. There must be some advantage for survival for being together. Herds of deer, apes, packs of wolves, all found in clumps of distributions. Make sense? Great. The big idea is it's still the availability of resources that's driving this entire thing. So now I want to give you a little case study and I want to think about this a little bit. So the population is eventually going to be affected by different types of uh, disruption or availability of resources. So I'm going to show this little case study and the question I have is there's an event that causes the population to no longer, it, you know, they, there's a die off uh, and I want to know is the population size driving the severity of this event? If the answer is yes, we're gonna call it a density dependent factor. If the answer is no, we're gonna call it a density independent factor. Did you guys see this? It was a couple years ago. It's a little graphic, but that's okay. 
never seen anything like it. Scientists went and studied and determined it was lightning. My first question is, uh, preamble to this, what, uni uh, what type of population distribution do we find the reindeer in? Clumped. They're clumped, right? So their population is all put together. So is the population size driving the severity of the event? What do you think? Yes. yes. Okay, you think yes. The, the, give me a defense. Well, because they clump together specifically during thunderstorms, the threat okay. would not be as such if they weren't as social. Okay, and so uh, they're, they're clumping. Go ahead. If they were uh, distributed more evenly, the lightning wouldn't have as much of an effect on all of them. So if they were more evenly, it wouldn't affect them as much? Well, yeah. Apparently they were all standing in the same puddle when they got electrocuted. So yeah. they hadn't all been standing in that one area all like next to each other, and they've been either randomly dispersed or way uniformly dispersed, there wouldn't have been as many reindeer. Okay, so let's think about this. Anybody want to say no? Let's do a thought exercise. So let's say that there are uh, a thousand reindeer, a herd of a thousand reindeer, they're all equally clumped as what we saw here, and the lightning strikes again. Is the severity of the event worse because the population size? So we have a, a clump of a thousand, and the lightning strikes and they all die. Is the severity of the event worse because of the population size? What do you think? What if it was different, like what Spencer said? It depends on how it looks, potentially. So if they're all clumped together, it could be pretty bad, but if they're all spread out, maybe not quite as bad, right? But is the population size the thing that's driving the event severity? No. Okay. So the severity is worse the more that there are, the larger the population, more are affected, but is the population size the thing that's driving the severity? That's oh. the question. No. So not necessarily. It's just that the fact that they're together, that's independent from the size. There we go. Is that what, okay. That's what I like. All right, let's check it out. Uh, let, let's overlay some key definitions here. So density dependent factors are ones where the population size is driving the effect. So the factors have a greater impact when the size or populations are greater and the density is, is higher. I really like this idea because we can overlay it to our case study with the wolves and the moose a little bit. Uh, this is trophic cascade where there's uh, somebody uphill is causing this uh, to be worse. So some examples are disease. So if the population, if we have a disease and then we put the population, we make it more dense, it's worse. It's not just that more individuals are affected, that at the actual effect gets worse because it's linked with the population density, right? Another would be famine. So if suddenly um, there's not enough resources because something happened, um, the more the population, the denser it is, the worse that's going to be. Of course, no matter what, it's always worse when the population is more, but as it gets greater, it's driving the effect. Yeah. So when you're saying density, that has nothing to do with the clumping. It's just the general... The general, how close is the population to its maximum size, which I'll explain a little oh, bit more in a second. Okay. Predation is another. Migration is another. So these things that are, <coughs> that are really top-down uh, controlling as the population gets more, uh, it gets worse. Density independent is the opposite. It makes no difference. It's something usually abiotic, something environmental, and it, it, it influences the survival. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a reindeer and you're part of uh, a herd with 10 or with 320. If lightning happens to strike where you're standing, you're toast. It doesn't matter how big your herd is. You're dead no matter what. It's not worse because of the population size. So we usually think of this like natural disasters, abiotic phenomena, uh, things that occur in that. And we'll define those as usually bottom-up effects. So those are, gonna per, uh, those are gonna affect the trophic le level because they're gonna be an environmental disruption that affects everything in the community. Ash cloud from mega volcano in Yellowstone, great example, right? 
So let's put this story together uh, based on what Cal was just explaining about population. Uh, here's what I here's what I want to look at. This, these are all citations from the text. So all of these graphs are things that you see in the modules uh, inside of your textbook. Uh, but what we see is, let's take something really simple to understand, like bacteria. You start with two individuals, and they both divide, and then you have four individuals, and then all of those divide, and you have eight and sixteen and so on and so forth. It produces a logarithmic curve. We call that the intrinsic growth rate. Intrinsic meaning it's just the thing that would naturally happen. If you didn't have any interference or any constraints at all, you would see this kind of J curve. Uh, we call this a J curve, exponential growth. It shows rapid and consistent growth, J curve. So over time, you would just have a, a, a big expansion of the population. However, we know because of everything that we've been talking about that that can go on forever because eventually the resources are going to be limited. So the po populations eventually move towards this line here that is it's called the K. Uh, it, it's defined here as K, the carrying capacity. This is the maximum number of resources. So eventually, uh, it could be something like food availability. Oops, we ate too much, now there's a famine. Yikes, we all died. Well, then they reproduce, and the wolves and the moose are fluctuating in this area quite a bit, and they're hovering around that carrying capacity. So you can go over it and below it, uh, but eventually things stabilize. So if we overlay the J curve, what happens at the beginning to what happens towards the end and plot it across time, uh, if we zoom out, this is what population growth tends to look like for all species. At first, there's a lot of intrinsic growth. Early growth is exponential, but it begins to slow as you get closer to limited resources. We get a little fluctuation around die-offs and overshoots, uh, but eventually uh, you get to a place where the carrying capacity is met and that organism is right on the edge. So now this is a space where inter Competition is high and intra-competition is high. So we have both the competitive exclusion principle applied, uh, which is, you know, uh, a moose and wolf and that kind of thing, but also available resources. Well, if there's only enough uh, resources uh, in our family in this area for five people and my parents had three kids, uh, we're good. But if they have four kids, somebody's not surviving. Mom, dad, or siblings, somebody's not going to make it because availability of resources. intra competition. Make sense? Great. Two more things in, to knock out for today. So here's that growth curve again, and this is really small. I took it from some scientific literature, and, and it looks a little bit hard, hard to see here, uh, but I wanted to give it to you anyways. Not every species always can, it will make it to be plotted over what we just saw, and their life strategy, their ability to survive, flourish, reproduce, etc., is driven by these resources, but also the way they choose to live their life. And so at the very beginning of this intrinsic life curve, uh, you have species that live like this, and then there's die-offs because of certain reasons, and there are other organisms that tend to live right at the carrying capacity with inside of an ecosystem. And we have terms for replying to these, and they don't perfectly overlay with generalists and specialists, but they do exist on a continuum in the same fashion. You could plot every single organism on planet Earth somewhere along this continuum. And it was, it's driven by biology. So, so let's get into it and think about this a little bit. The R selected species, their strategy for survival of their species tends to look like this. Uh, they're pretty small organisms. They have tons of offspring. When I say many offspring here, this means like they, they try to have thousands and thousands and thousands of offspring. They don't even try at all to make sure anybody survives. Who can raise thousands and thousands of kids? I'm just gonna uh, pollinate this flower and there's gonna be millions of seeds produced and hopefully some of them turn into new flowers. Or I'm an insect and I'm gonna I'm going to put out tons of eggs, and who knows how many survive. I'm done with my life. I hope they <laughs> survive. Fish, fish eggs, uh, lots of organisms like that, but, uh, many species of bacteria. 
So they, their lives are short, they usually reproduce only one time, and it's driven by the competition for resources uh, because the habitats, it's pretty low. So we could all survive, but there's something else, so there's probably uh, competition or there's probably predation or there's probably environmental factors that just make it so I don't survive. So insects are my favorite example uh, because insects, they, they, their life is like three weeks long as an adult. They, they try to reproduce, um, but um, there's plenty of resources in the environment. There's enough leaf foliage for lots of earthworms to survive. They produce thousands of eggs, but eventually what we have is winter and everybody dies off the animals. So uh, the, the, the thing that's causing their population to be controlled is usually not the resource availability, it's usually something else. Our selected species. K-selected species are on the other end of the continuum. These are usually larger organisms, whales, bears, people, elephants. They have relatively few offspring. So in contrast, to, I have tens of thousands of offspring or tens of thousands of eggs produced. I maybe have 12 or I have two. Or maybe even I have 50 in my lifetime uh, because I reproduce more than one time. And not just this year, I might do it again later. We have different seasons, we survive. And because I want all of my offspring to survive, I spend a lot of time making sure they have what they need and nurturing them. So mammals, as an example, uh, mature for many years after life, parental, they're usually more social. And the thing that's driving them is this side of the curve. Eventually, there are only so many resources. So I want to make sure that my offspring have the survival strategies to navigate a life where there's not a lot of uh, resources. And they have to be divided up, so a lot of energy is spent um, to help those. I like this table because uh, it's pretty clean and discreet. Table 19.1 in your textbook. Uh, it's a nice study tool to just go over and, and think about these things. Uh, but there are organisms that fall in the middle. I mentioned as part of this that this is driven by biology and evolution. So an organism doesn't wake up and say, you know what would be nice if I was a little more case selected? That would be pretty good. Uh, that's not how it works. The environment, the resources, the abiotic factor, the intraspecific con competition, the interspecific competition, over time has driven evolution to produce this. So if you're a bear and you're a generalist and your life strategy is you have to be able to survive and you don't know when you're going to find a mate, well, you better be case selected. It's not like you come up with that. It's what evolution has produced over time. Which brings me to my last slide and my last thing to discuss for today, which is called survivorship curves. Let's look at the graph first and just try to understand what the axes tell us. So the first thing is age in relative units. So what it's telling us is we want to normalize every single species on Earth and put them, this is how long their life cycle is. So their life cycle could be in the example of humans from age zero to age 80, or it could be in the example of insect from age zero to three months. We're gonna plot them all on the same and just say this is your life cycle, okay? <laughs> on the y-axis, it shows you the number of survivors. The number of survivors. So we can plot every organism well, how many survive across their life cycle? Let's first look at type one and, and, and see uh, how this kind of fits together. The classic example is humans, but it's lots of generalists, it's lots of case-selected species, and it makes perfect sense. So the survivorship, for example, I spend a lot of energy raising my own two kids, and I wanna make sure that all those kids survive till adulthood, and most do. Uh, if the, we only have few offspring and we spend a lot of energy to help them survive and make sure they have the resources and teach and do all of these things. They live in social environments and uh, it isn't until they get to an older age and then you get a really steep drop off because things like disease and uh, regulated cell death, apoptosis, all of these effects that take effect and eventually the, you have a quick die off. Makes sense, right? 
Does it? <laughs> when you said it like that, it's like you clicked out. It makes sense. So. It does. Let's look at type three as the alternative example. This is, I, many plants fall into this. Many insects fall into this. Lots of species of small fish, things that are really low on the trophic uh, levels. So when resources are limited and you're case selected, uh, you're likely to be type one, but when the resources are driven and some other thing driven, uh, you're usually in our selected species and this is your strategy for life. Maybe every oak tree out here has pollinated acorns and they fall on the ground and there are thousands of them. We spend almost no energy and only a few of them survive. But of the acorns that get into the ground and make a sapling, most of those live to be adult trees and they live for a super long time. Same is true with insects. Tons of eggs, most of them get gobbled up really fast and they die or they don't survive because of abiotic reasons. But the ones that do survive, usually lay thousands of eggs themselves and live to adulthood. So you see most of the die off happening early on in their life and then the ones that survive tend to survive for a long time. Type two is the final example and, and we'll be on with our day. I know we're close to the end of the time, but the type two curve means you're, it's a linear line. You're just as likely to die any minute that you're alive. That's a lot of birds, a lot of mice, a lot of rodents. If you're a mouse and you wake up, you're just as likely to be chomped by a fox today as you are tomorrow. It makes no difference. Your survival is dependent usually on these interspecies factors. So somebody else is controlling your fate, not you, and you're just trying to survive. And Maybe one day you have resources, the next day you don't. Maybe one day you get chomped, maybe one day you don't. You never know what's going to happen. So your survivorship is plotted. Plot almost all birds, all rodents, and those types of things if we put all the species on planet Earth, what type do they mostly fall under? Most species fall under this. Most species that you recognize fall under one of these two things because we have a bias to pay attention to mammals and, and birds and those kinds of things. That is survivorship curves. Excellent job today, gang. Lots of stuff for us.